afternoon all. My name's James Spencer and uh, my book talk will be on Alexander the Great by Robin Lane Fox. So, a little context. Mr. Robin Lane Fox, or I should say rather Dr. Robin Lane Fox, born in 1946 and is a British historian, currently a fellow of New College in Oxford and University of Oxford as the reader in ancient history, which is very, very high renowned positions and speaks to his credentials and this kind of subject. Since 77, he's been a tutor in Greek and Roman history, and since 1990, he's been the university reader in ancient history. He's also a professor of Greek and Latin literature and early Islamic history, a subject in which he held an Oxford Research Fellowship. He's a lecturer in ancient history at Exeter College, Oxford. He is best perhaps known nowadays as the historical advisor to the film director Oliver Stone for the epic film Alexander, which was somewhat of a box office bomb, but that was due to many factors. And as you can see, there's an image of him as an extra and as an advisor there advising Oliver Stone, which is pretty cool. I wish I could do that. <clears throat> uh, apart from his appearance as an extra and as a his and uh, the historical consultant, uh, he also spends some of his downtime as a gardening correspondent for the Financial Times back in London, showing that he's a jack of all trades. <clears throat> so moving on to our centerpiece of this book talk, Alexander the Great. It's a bit of a lengthy work there, 576 pages, but uh, you know, with such a life filled with all sorts of adventures and action, you need that many pages to get it. Get everything you need. <clears throat> so, the life and times of the great conqueror as told by ancient and modern sources. Alexander's military achievements are to this day unparalleled. He had excelled as a leader to his men, founded 18 new cities in his namesake, and even a couple named after his horse, Bucephalus, and essentially stamped the face of Greek culture on the ancient world, which was Asia and Europe at that time, as far as the Greeks knew it in those days. However, there are always two sides to every story. Alexander's character and personality has also come into question throughout this work, such as his traits as uh, being having a penchant for making rash overreactions and often succumbing to delusions of grandeur. <clears throat> the mythos he created is potent as it was today, as it was today in the ancient world. He was renowned for very, very much protecting his uh, cult of personality and his image. <clears throat> the combination of historical scholarship and critical psychological insight resurrects the colossal figure of Alexander for modern audiences. It's the best way to sum up this work. <clears throat> As for the subgenre this book falls into, uh, it is a biography. No none of the references were written by Alexander himself, but some of them were written by first-hand accounts such as Callisthenes, his court historian. <clears throat> Although with that being said, though, a lot of times with, uh, you know, working in the court there, you come under a lot of pressure such as to write overly flattering accounts of the man. So, we have some uh, critical and reader response to his book. So first of all, Oliver Stone, the director of the movie, said it was so enjoyable and well-written Fox's book became my main guide through Alexander's amazing story, which you can see anytime you want to. Uh... <clears throat> so, uh, second, uh, the second little piece of review here was, I don't know which to admire most, his vast erudition or his imaginative grasp of such a remote and complicated period and complex personality such as Alexander's. That was from Cyril Connolly in the Sunday Times in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> so moving on to the appeal aspects of this book. Firstly, the amount of intrigue in this work is astounding. Alexander lived a short life filled with glory, adventure, alongside several other misadventures and shortcomings. Also, new interpretations of the historical sources such as Callisthenes and uh, Diodorus Siculus, to name some of the ancient historians, reveal Alexander and, Alexander and his personality and motives in a new light. For instance, Alexander's sexuality has been re-examined through a modern context in Robin Lane's Fox work. 
The film adaptation of the book actually came under criticism due to its portrayal as Alexander's being essentially heterosexual, which, according to all, all the ancient sources, that was certainly not the case. He was at least bisexual, and if not, probably more homosexual in his sexual behavior. The real reason for the, the suppression was, in fact, that uh, during the filming of this movie, 25 Greek lawyers actually tried to sue the, the production company, claiming that uh, they're portray portraying Alexander in the wrong light, although, in fact, they're just... I don't know, it's kind of revisionist history, it's their moralistic views of the of the man instead of the actual historical truth, because back in the ancient days, human sexuality was a lot more different than it is nowadays, which, you know, the more that you read about these things, you'll be more aware of these. <clears throat> so, apart from that little bit of intrigue there, uh, we get to, like, review the traditional view of Alexander, and uh, come to our own conclusions. Yeah. Uh, Robin Lane Fox, his research has uh, revealed that uh, Alexander was indeed very mortal. And, in fact, terribly insecure, seen through many of the reactions in the many eventful moments of his life. And another little bit of intrigue here is the parsing through the validity of these sources. For some of these ancient sources used to speak of the dog-headed people in India, right? So nowadays we have, you know, modern historians that can read between the lines of the context and realize that these sources that refer to all these fantastical creatures are probably not the most valid sources and are often kind of glazed over nowadays. As Back in the past, they were kind of taken at their word and you know it's kind of passed down as a falsehood right so that's the thing with history we kind of got to parse out throughout the truth from what is just speculation and just hearsay <clears throat> so moving on to uh the theme of my book talk in my read-alikes <clears throat> all three read-alikes contain settings during wartime throughout several periods of history these works are centered around characters who have strong leadership qualities, both male and female. However, these books use differing sources, such as primary, secondary, even tertiary sources, and autobiographical sources as well. We also include different genres, such as uh, historical fiction, to make this book talk more engaging. In that same vein, I've also tried to include works that contain characters from many diverse backgrounds, such as rich and poor, I also tried to include works that contain characters that uh, contain people of color in leadership positions to make this book talk and read alike more relatable and engaging for everybody. <clears throat> so moving on to our read alikes. Read alike number one, Joan of Arc in Her Own Words by Willard Trask. <clears throat> Joan of Arc's biography, essentially, gives us a much needed female perspective of mili military leadership. <clears throat> it is largely based on her personal transcripts. In other words, this is the closest we can get to knowing her, what was going through her head as she was living the events during the Hundred Years' War. <clears throat> this is a contrast from Al the Alexander the Great book, which contains no reference to his personal writings. Alexander, like many other leaders throughout history, certainly would have coerced writers of his day into producing overly flattering accounts of himself and the events that he lived. This certainly would cause a skewed perspective, thus the need for modern historical analysis, as was the case in that book. <clears throat> this rare factor of containing the most authoritative sources, essentially right from Joan of Arc's own mouth, is a major reason why I've included this book in my read in my read alike slash book talk. My read alike slash book talks, rather. Renown renowned for her piety, Joan of Arc's words will be relatively biased, free of biases, such as revisionist history or self-promotion, which was not always the case in the, my rema remaining two read-alikes books. With that being said, though, there would definitely be some sort of biases in her writing, because uh, she was definitely known for her piety, so there would definitely be overly religious tones in her works, but it would still be just absolutely fascinating to, to find out what was going on through her head through this amazing period of time. So moving on to read-alike number two, kind of taking a different kind of approach here. <clears throat> this work is called uh, 
The Undertaker's Assistant by Amanda Skinnador. So this is an, an enthralling novel. It's a powerful story of human resilience set during the Reconstruction Era in New Orleans, as well as it. the first part of the book takes per, place in the Civil War. <clears throat> to kind of give you some context there as well. I believe the choice of a work of fiction such as this novel gives this read-alike and book talk a much-needed balance in terms of the genres provided to our readers. We need some non-fiction to go with fiction to essentially appeal to everybody. <clears throat> That's what I think, anyway. So, this book is centered around Effie Jones, a former, ensla a former enslaved woman who escaped to the Union side as a child. She was taken in by an army surgeon who taught her how to le read and write and to... Uh, Essentially, his trade taught her how to be a surgeon. <clears throat> now, a young freed woman, she has returned south, back home, down to New Orleans, where she is earning a living as an embalmer. <clears throat> Despite her reticence of returning back home, she has two chance encounters, one with a charismatic state legislator named Sansom Green, and the other with a beautiful young Creole, Adeline. Both introduce her to new worlds of protests and activism, activisms combined with the other side of society, high society, soirees, and social ambition. <clears throat> As her hopes are tested by betrayals, and New Orleans grapples with the violence and growing racial turmoil of those days, Effie faces much loss, but also a chance to finally find her place in this world. <clears throat> Moving on to my final read-alike. Title number three. This is El Libertador, Writings of Simon Bolivar, by the man himself, Simon Bolivar. While often compared to Alexander the Great and George Washington, Simon Bolivar was the leader of independent of the leader of the independence movement from colonial Spain, which resulted in the creation of six sovereign nations in Latin America: Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Panama, Peru and Bolivia, which is essentially his name. <clears throat> like the Joan of Arc title, it is based virtually on his own writings, which I believe to be an appeal factor for this would reveal deep insights into the personality of the famous historical figure from his very own words, just like Joan of Arc. However, unlike Joan of Arc, Bolivar was known to have some uh, faults in his character, such as being known for his self-aggrandizing behavior and uh, his relatively loose morality. He was a man who was certainly uh, ruled by his heart and uh, renowned for his notorious womanizing. However, I believe reading between the lines, so to speak, is an appeal factor of this work. For instance, Bolivar was, he, for instance, in this work, Bolivar writing about a person such as a political rival in this book could be skewed from the truth for he could have an ax to grind with this person which be, would be revealed in personal writings such as these. Regardless of the veracity of all parts of this work, this work will remain highly intriguing due to its personal insight from a strong leader from history. Also another appeal factor of note is uh, he was from a biracial background, yet descended from the local aristocracy, meaning that in his day he had one foot in high society and one in the lower strata, which is a unique perspective, and I would consider that an appeal factor. <clears throat> so this has been the final read-alike choice for my book talk i hope you've enjoyed this book talk as much as i've enjoyed creating it and uh i would just like to say take care and uh ciao till next time